بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم خيركم قرني ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم My dear respected friends Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh uh, this series of yours that you've just launched in which you'll be discussing different tabi'een which follows on from your series of last time which was dealing with the different uh, companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this is a very blessed task and the reason the reason for this is that we are today inshallah in the first part of your series we are inshallah going to be drinking from the springs of these great people and what they've left for us these are quite amazing individuals because the scholars say that purely just the mention of these people because of what they did and what they achieved, it brings about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His forgiveness. Ulama say that we can actually expect to attain paradise through the love of these individuals and especially through following in their footsteps. This is a person who we're going to speak about today, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. Just the name on its own has always inspired me. Just the name on its own. Abdullah, one of the most beloved names to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the servant of Allah, saying it as it is. The son of Mubarak. Mubarak means the blessed one. That name on its own, the servant of God, son of the blessed, is just amazing within its own. It's not an exotic name. It's a real name. It's a meaningful name. It's a rich name, not just a nice sounding star name as such. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. This person that we're speaking about is one of the most unique of these individuals. He's always inspired. He's always inspired so many people. He is from the Khayrul Qurun, the hadith that I just related. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Khayrukum Qarni, the best of you, meaning the best of this entire nation until the day of judgment, the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is going to be my generation. He was speaking to them. The people who were there when the Prophet ﷺ was alive, these are the companions. He says, the best of you are my, na- are, are my generation, then those who follow them, and then those who will follow them. He spoke about three generations, his generations, and the two to follow the, uh, two to follow the companions. So the generation of the companions, generation of who we call the successors, the tabi'een, and then the atba'u tabi'een, who are the followers of the followers. So there we speak about approximately the, up to the second century, to the atba'u tabi'een. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, amazingly, he is born in 118 Hijri. 118 Hijri. That is, as you know, after the migration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa 118 years. He was born in 118 and he dies, very interestingly, in 181 Hijri. So it's very easy to remember his date. It's 18 and 81. Just flip it around. 118, 181. That's when he passes away at the age of 63. But what a life. What a life. And an absolutely amazing life. These, he is among the people and at the forefront of those people who sacrificed, who sacrificed their lives for the preservation of this faith and the spread of this faith. So that this faith could come to us in its pristine purity as it had been revealed to the Messenger of Allah Uncorrupted, as close as possible to the original by going far and wide as you will understand from his travels to try to garner all of this information, all of the traditions of Rasulullah so that it could be recorded, preserved and then passed on and conveyed throughout the generations. We learn about these people so we can be inspired. So we can be inspired, we can learn from them, and we can then similarly aspire to attain what they did, and inshallah, allow God to be happy with us as well, and thus to be in paradise, Jannatul Firdaus, and above all, to also be a means today of continuing to propagate this religion to the people after us, despite wherever we may be in the world. So today we're speaking about a very, very unique individual, a sign of the signs of Allah, ayatu min ayatillah. 
he is considered to be somebody who has been agreed upon. You, we have many, many scholars of our past when you read about them. Somebody or the other may have criticized them for something or the other. But one thing that's very unique about Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak is that he is an agreed upon personality. He is an agreed upon personality. personality. In fact, as we will read later on, some of the scholars have said that there's no virtuous characteristic. There's no good meritorious character that Allah has revealed except that he also gave it to Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. He was just a combination of somebody who incorporated all of these great and wonderful characteristics. That's why the Ummah has referred to him as the Shaykh al-Islam, the Shaykh of Islam, the, the, the foremost teacher of Islam. In fact, you know the Muhaddithin, the Hadith scholars, they give him the title Amirul Mu'mineen of Al-Hadith, the leader of the believers in Hadith. So he's not an Amirul Mu'mineen as in somebody claiming to rule over the, the, the land, but he ruled over the hearts of people without, without a police force, just by merely the power of his righteousness and his learning and his beauty and his goodwill towards the Ummah. So let's understand who this person is. Abdullah ibn al his name is Abdullah ibn al Mubarak. That's his father's name, Ibn Wadih al Hanzali. So he's from this Hanzali tribe. He's not from the Han uh, At Tamimi Mawlahum. Now, let me give you an explanation. He is not an original Arab. His father was Turkic origin, was of Turkic origin. His mother was. Khawarizmi, which is uh, Khawarizm today is in the northern parts of Uzbekistan. So we can say that they were Transoxianian in a sense, non-Arabs. Both his mother and father were non-Arabs. However, in the time of the Umayyad rule, in the, uh, during the Umayyads, the non-Arabs to be able to stay in the, within, the realm of, uh, uh, within their realms, they would ha have to uh, become a client of one of the Arab tribes. They would have to make an agreement. That's one way that they would become what they call a client or a mawla. And thus, he was linked to the Tamimi tribe, the famous Banu Tamim tribe of the Arabs. Others say that his father was actually a slave of this man at the time. There was slavery at the time. So he was a slave. Later, it seems like he was freed. And then Abdullah ibn Mubarak became what he was. This actually tells you that in Islam, slavery is a whole different ball game when it was around that slaves became great scholars great leaders in fact you actually had a whole dynasty called the mamluks you yeah, called the mamluks uh, they they were originally slaves but they became actually the leaders of the muslim world at one time in egypt and other places so that's a d different subject let me not take us off track here so that that is his father's uh, of turkic origin his mother is from khawarism and Ibn al Jawzi mentions that when you do look into the books of history, don't get confused sometimes because there are actually four people with this name. Abdullah ibn al Mubarak. Abdullah, the son of Mubarak. There are actually four people. But by far, the one we're speaking about, Al Marwazi, he is the most famous one. So he is called Al Marwazi. The reason he's called Al Marwazi is because he came from a place called Marwa. My investigation into Marwa leads me to a place, a town in Turkmenistan today, which is on the Oxus River, which was one of the very famous routes in that time. And the Oxus River was very famous and is still famous, but it's called Mer Mer Mari or Meri, right? So that re relating to that, as uh, being connected to that, he's called Marwazi. There, there's other scholars who are called Marruthi because they hail from another place called Marwa Ruth which is also in Khurasan, in that area. So he's from Marwa, which at that time was one of the greatest cities of the Muslim lands. And what tells us that? From that same city of Marwa, we had such great scholars that I'm sure majority of us may have heard of them. The likes of Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, that's where he is from. Though he was in Baghdad later and he pretty much spent the rest of his life and he's buried in Baghdad as far as I know. He was from Marr. Sufyan al Thawri is another one who was from Marr. And Ishaq ibn Rahway or Rahuya, another very famous scholar of hadith and jurisprudence. I just read yesterday uh, from Ibn al Jawzi, one of the great scholars of Baghdad, a very prolific writer, historian, hadith scholar, uh, theology scholar, uh, an amazing, an amazing polymath of uh, you know, numerous sciences. 
He says that I did an investigation of the early scholars to see who had become absolutely complete and fully accomplished in two fields. One in the sciences, who had mastered all the sciences that were available at the time. And number two, who had also mastered their obedience and devotion to Allah. So if they are in sciences up there, then in their obedience, their worship, their piety, their righteousness, and their devotion to Allah, they are also up there. And he says, after looking at everybody, what I notice is that if somebody is very good in his sciences, his, his worship will be sacrificed. And if somebody is very good in devotion, then he doesn't have the same amount of knowledge. But he says, there are three people that stood out. And when I read that, I was like, wow. And he said, he said the three people, one was Hassan al-Basri, and I don't think there can be any disagreement about this. A scholar and yet such a righteous individual. Hassan al-Basri, the second person he mentioned was Sufyan al-Thawri, subhanAllah. And the third person he mentioned was Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And then he mentions the fourth person, he says that if somebody wants to add a fourth, I won't have any problem with this name. I personally would add Abdullah ibn Mubarak as number four. Because he is a name that sticks out in that regard. Because he had mastered all of the sciences as well. Imam Dhahabi. Imam Dhahabi says about him in his Siru Alam in Nubala. He says, now listen to this. He says, Al-Imam, Shaykh al-Islam, Alimu zamanihi, wa Amir al-Atqiya fi waqtihi, Ha al-Hafid, al-Ghazi, Ahad al-A'lam. Now what does that mean? He's combining a number of different things. He's saying he is the Imam, the leader. He is the Shaykh of Islam. He is the, he is the scholar of his time, the foremost scholar of his time. Like if you want to say, this is the scholar of his time. Right? Then he is the leader of the righteous ones of his time. He is a master, a hadith master, which means somebody who's memorized at least 100,000 hadith. At least a hundred thousand hadith by, by heart is a hafiz. Today, the hafiz in our community is somebody who's just memorized the Quran. But these people were memorized, of the, uh, they'd memorized the Quran and a hundred thousand hadiths. And that's quite small. There were people who had million hadith to their name. Like Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. A thousand thousand narrations. He was a ghazi, he was a warrior in the path of Allah. And he is considered to be one of the great luminaries. I'm not going to go through all of the other, there's numerous other people who have spoken about the various different sciences that he was a master in. I mean, I think this suffices to tell you. Now, where does all of this come from? This is very important. If we cannot do something, but we can definitely lay the foundations for our next generation. This is what I learned from this. This had to come from somewhere. Where did it come from? It comes from his father this time. Generally it comes through the mothers, right? But this time, it's his father who, who's taking the light here. His father was, as I mentioned, a slave or a worker, an employee. There's both opinions that I found in the books of a man from, the Hamadha, from Hamadhan. Hamadhan is in Persia. And he used to work in an orchard. This was a, uh, in one narration, he mentions grapes. In uh, another one mentions rumman, which means um, pomegranates. So he is a caretaker of this orchard. He is their gardener. He looks after it. And, you know, he, he works to protect it. He works to clean it up, whatever, whatever it is that he has. One day, the owner comes along, his employer, his master, whoever, whatever it is. And he says to him, bring me, bring me a piece of fruit, meaning bring me a pomegranate. So he quickly goes and he thinks this looks nice. So he goes and he gives it to him. And the... The master takes a bite of this and it is extremely sour. He says, what's wrong with you? Get me another one. Get me a nicer one. This is, this is very sour. So he goes and he goes and he picks up another one very innocently. Oh, this must look nice. And he goes and gives it to him again. Same problem. It's very sour. He sends him a third time. And then, and finally he says, what's wrong with you? Can you, uh, can you not understand what's a good pomegranate from a bad pomegranate, you know, a ripe one from an unripe one, meaning in a sense what's a sweet one and a sour one? He says, no, this, I don't know. And his, his, his master is just completely dumbfounded. He says, what's wrong with you? How come you don't know? You must be eating this stuff every day. He says, no, I've never tasted a single one. He says, what? You haven't had a single pomegranate from me? He says, no, I've not seen because it's not mine. I don't have permission to do so. And he's just totally dumbstruck and he says, 
فقد أذنت. You know, like go and eat them. You know, I I give you permission. You know, because the default in a lot of places is that they just eat things. You know, because they think well, all of these they, they dropped. You know, maybe they dropped uh, or maybe it's a bit defective one. People just justify. He says, no, I didn't have the permission, so that's why I didn't do it. Now you see, his father is so so righteous in this regard that he's been working there for so many years and he hasn't tasted a single pomegranate from that uh, from that place. So anyway, this farmer goes and speaks to his. This farmer goes and speaks to his wife and says that, you know, this is what happened today. So his wife said, you know, we've got a daughter. We, we need, this is a perfect man to marry him to. People are looking for honesty. They love honesty. People are looking for, you know, honest people. So he said, you should marry, uh, ma- marry him to our daughter. So the master comes along and says that, you know, we, uh, to Mubarak, that we want you to marry our daughter. So again, he's a man of principles. And he says, uh, you know, he says the people in the time of ignorance used to marry women for their lineage, for their family tree, right? Because that was very important for them to get a, get a girl from a good family, right? And then he mentions a number of other people and he says uh, the, the, this particular type of people, they used to they marry people for beauty, this particular group, they marry for wealth. But in, the, in Islam, we marry for deen, we marry for religion. So he goes back and he tells his wife that this is what he's saying, but then he comes and he persists. He says, and his wife says, no, you must, you, know, you must get him married to our daughter. So then he marries his master's daughter, who's originally from Khawarizm. So that's his mother. That's Mubarak. That's the wife now of Mubarak, right? Mubarak's wife. And from them comes this great man called Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, right? From this really beautiful union. We don't know too much about his childhood. There's just one story that's mentioned in the biographies. Uh, Khatib al-Baghdadi, the great historian of Baghdad, I mean, an amazing individual, right? And I think we need to speak about him one day. He is just an amazing, he's written a 50 volume book on Baghdad, right? The great city at that time. It was one of the greatest cities of the Abbasid Caliphate. So he writes about Ibn al-Mubarak. He's quoting from a friend of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak who was a friend from a young age. He says, once we were just students in the local madrasa, in the local school, and we pass by a person giving a speech, a sermon, right? This lengthy sermon, somebody was giving a sermon, and it was quite a long sermon, so we sat in there throughout. As we, we came out, Abdullah ibn Mubarak said to me, that, do you know what, I've actually memorized all of that. I've memorized that entire sermon. So there was a man who was standing there, and he heard this conversation. So just to test him, he said, repeat it to us then. You know, let, let's see if you know it. And he started and repeated the whole sermon in the way that individual had, had delivered it. So we, we learned that he had, a, he had a really extensive memory and really extensive memory from that time. We don't know too much else about him at that time. But another thing that, uh, another thing that we understand is that he then seemed to have gone through a bit of a patch, as some people do. Right, where he started enjoying life as such in a different way. Right, you enjoy life. You don't. This is just a different way where he started drinking nabiv. Right, this was just kind of semi. It could be semi fermented because you couldn't have wine in many of these places. So what you took is you took some dates and so on. You uh, soak them overnight, and if you soak them for too long, they would actually become a bit fermented and give you a bit of intoxication. It was a homemade kind of a brew as such. Right. So uh, he said once. Uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, who was his teacher, because he later went to study with Imam Abu Hanifa in Kufa, Imam Abu Hanifa once asked him, he said that, how did you start off? You know, he, he saw something about him. He says that, what's your story? He says, well, when I was much younger, I was sitting with my friends. I was just in, having a party, basically, in our orchard. I was having a, uh, having a party, and we just kept eating and drinking until the nightfall. And we had drink, uh, drunk too much, and we were playing the oud. We were playing the oud, which is a musical instrument you know, used in those places, and the tambur. Right, so we were, we were just basically enjoying ourselves, right? With the music was, you know, the music was there, the drinks were flowing, and so on. And then uh, I, I, I slept very late, and I saw in my dream at this time, I saw in my dream that there was now. There's two versions here that's related about this, right? They're very similar. That he says, I saw in my dream a bird above my head on the tree because I fell asleep under the tree. I, I saw the bird saying, and that's why I was going to ask, where's our qari gone? Who, who just read? What, why did you pick that verse? Okay, but you, 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 don't, you didn't see, yeah, I mean, you haven't seen any relevance to that with Abdullah ibn Barak, right? Okay, well, what's very interesting, because I was surprised, and I said this is from Allah, right? 
This is the verse that he heard from the, ver uh, from the birds. That bird said, Alam amanu an So I was, when I was listening to you read, I was just like, wow, my, you know, the, the hairs on my body were standing at end. I said, like, either this guy knows this story or this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's got the right verse. Because it is such a wonderful verse. Hasn't the time come for the people who believe? I mean, Abdullah ibn Barak was a believer. He was from a Muslim household, right? But he'd now gotten engaged with all of these playful, you know, these play things, right? In lahu al-a'ib, as you call it, right? In past times of the world for without any substance. So hasn't the time come for those people who believe that their hearts succumb and submit to the remembrance of Allah and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed of the truth? And they should not be like the people of the past, that they waited for too, too long and then their hearts became too hard. Because of the dunya, the heart becomes too hard. Then it becomes very difficult for, for a person to change or then to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is a verse that he heard and he said, Bala, of course it's come. So when he woke up, he just woke up and he came to realization. And he says that I broke my oud, you know, my musical instrument, and I just burnt everything that I had with me of these, uh, the, these instruments. So I basically burned my iPhone, right, and, and all the rest of it, right. And he says that this was the beginning of it. This was the beginning of it. He then said that that's when I started turning to knowledge and worship. And then he didn't leave it behind. So this tells us something, and you know, he, he, he started traveling for knowledge at the age of 23. So he tells us that, you know, even if you've messed around for two years, three years, four years, you still got a lot of time. This is a man who started studying at the age of 23, right? You know, studying the deen in, in great depth to become a scholar as such, right? He started studying at the age of 23, not at 15, not at 12, not at 9. Right? He probably studied a bit at that age, but this is when he seriously started studying. He left his city and the city of Marru. He left this city at the age of 23 in about 141 Hijri, AH. And then he started traveling. Khatib al-Baghdadi says that Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal says, and when Imam Ahmad speaks, he doesn't speak nonsense. He is an authority. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal said, Lam yakun fi zaman ibn al-Mubarak In the time of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak There was nobody who was a greater and more avid speaker or seeker of knowledge than him Where did he travel? He traveled to Yemen Now remember where he is If I could bring up a map here I would show you Right? Go and consult a map afterwards He traveled from Mar which is in Turkmenistan Turkmenistan is above Iran So you got Took Turkmenistan, you've got Iran, next to it you've got Iraq, and then after that you've got Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, right? And then at the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula you've got Yemen, and then further out still you've got Egypt. Now we're talking about a few thousand kilometers, right? We're talking about, uh, you know, uh, over a thousand miles we're speaking about. And if you have tried sitting on a camel, and just going a mile on a camel, believe me, it is very different to sitting in a nice seat in a car. Because you are there exposed to the elements, bumping up and down, going very, very, very slowly. And it's not that comfortable. You know, then the nice seats that you have in your car and the speed that you go with and the smoothness of the roads that we have or the flights that we can take. Despite us having facilities available to us, we cannot do what he, what he did. And you haven't even heard anything yet. So Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah is saying he traveled to Yemen. He traveled to Egypt. He traveled to the Levant, Syria. He traveled to Kufa and Basra, which were the main cities in Iraq at the time. Baghdad didn't exist at that time. He was from the narrators of the science. He was from the transmitters, those who took from the earlier generation and was pivotal in conveying and transmitting this knowledge to the next generation. He comes in, if you pick up Bukhari, Sahih al-Bukhari, Muslim and all these other books, you will see Abdullah ibn Mubarak there. Which means that he is a means of conveying this religion to us. Because this is where all of this came from. Right? This is why when you read him, you will say, Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on him. And you are remembering this person. He took, now he was very interesting, he took from wherever he could get knowledge. He took from the those who were older than him, he took from those who were his contemporaries and you know his age, and he also took from people that were younger than him. He didn't care where it came from. He, he would just take whatever was correct 
Sahih, whatever was authentic, he would take from wherever it, wherever it was. Ibn al waddah says that Ibn al-Mubarak has related about 25,000 hadith. Right? Now, in our lifetime, if we can just relate 40 hadith, that would be wonderful. He had related 25,000 hadith. And towards the end of his life, he's still, he's still acquiring knowledge and teaching. And one day somebody said to him, up until when are you going to study your knowledge? He said, I hope that you will find, I hope that you will find, find me doing that until I die. Until the last moment. And even until his last moment, he was still asking questions. And somebody said, and he says that maybe the, the, the one word that will benefit me has not reached me yet. That will have a profound impact on me. Qadi Abu uh, Abul Fadl said that Sad Sadafi has mentioned, when Ibn al-Mubarak came of age, so this was probably around 23 or so, his father now was a good businessman and was very wealthy, it seemed. You know, after this incident uh, that we spoke about earlier, it seemed that he had done well for himself. So his father sent him 50,000 dirhams to start a business. Right? 50,000 dirhams to start a business. What he used that money for is to travel and to seek knowledge. From go place to place, you need money for that. You need money to survive, you need money for eating, for lodging, for traveling. And he finished it off. His father, when he, when he met his father eventually after all of this excursion, he says, what have you brought back? Like, what's your business? Right? And he said, I got all of these books. He had brought books back with the money. He says, this is my trade, my trade for the akhirah, for the, for the hereafter. His father went into the house and he gave him another 30,000. He said, he said, he said, yeah, get, go ahead and do some more business, like proper business now. Again, he spent it all in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again. In fact, on one occasion, I think his father, it relates in, uh, it relates in one, of the, uh, one, one of the transmissions that his father got a bit uh, upset with him and he said, I'm going to burn all of your books. He says, no, you can't burn my books anymore because I've memorized all of them. You can't, they're all in my heart now. You can't, you can't burn them anymore. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, he went and he studied under numerous scholars, including Imam Abu Hanifa, and that's why he says, indi min Abi Hanifa. The fiqh that I have, the understanding of jurisprudence, is from Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. And he says, Lawla anna Allah ta'ala a'anani bi Abi Hanifa wa Sufyan lakuntu kasa'ir nas If Allah had not uh, supported me and helped me by uh, teaching me through Abu Hanifa and uh, Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahumullah ta'ala, then I would have just been like any ordinary person. He mentions uh, an, a number of things, but one thing is that he may have picked, he then did start doing some business. So while he would travel, it seems like it doesn't mention what business he would do. Imam Abu Hanifa would do business in cloth. He was a cloth merchant, very wealthy one at that. And he didn't have to take part in the business directly, he didn't have to sit in a shop. He had people to work for him. And mashallah, he used to make huge amounts of money and give to others as well. And it looks like Abdullah ibn Mubarak also has learned this from him. And that's what he starts to do. He does get into business. You know, once you're a businessman, your family's into business, you will see business wherever you go around, right? It's up to you to choose what you want or what you don't want. That's generally how it works. So he did do business. Ibn, uh, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, one of his statements, beautiful statements about seeking knowledge is that the beginning of knowledge is intention. Why am I seeking it? I want to seek it. This is my objective in seeking it. Once you have that intention, then you need to listen. So the first is intention, second is listening carefully so that you get from the source. Number three then is action. You're not just studying for exams, remember that. Unfortunately, our modern system is all about ratings, it's all about degrees, and sometimes what people are studying is redundant, sometimes. Sometimes people get stuck in very specific areas of study that they do not feel inclined to afterwards and then after that they're in a dilemma they start changing careers and it gets crazy and unfortunately it's a cutthroat uh, industry right now where degrees ha don't have much value unless you're in uh, you're in imperial maybe right hopefully inshallah or ucl or you know some some place like that but it's just a cutthroat it's just really sad and you're pitted uh, against each other in order to you know in order to uh, to get somewhere with this but anyway he, he says so then it's a first intention then listening then understanding then action practice action and then preservation how are you going to record this for other people to benefit from and then it's spreading it now remember this 
what I mentioned to you of, uh, of Ibn al Jawzi, who spoke about the three scholars that he assessed to have attained accomplishment in both worship and practice as well as knowledge. Right, so this is, you need that kind of motivation uh, to do this. Nu'aym ibn Hamad, one of the great scholars of the time, he says that Ibn al-Mubarak used to, though he traveled so much, otherwise he would sit in his house. He wasn't a very public, social person as such, in, in that sense. He was very, very disciplined. He would always be in his room. He would always be in his house. So somebody said to him, Allah tastawhish, like, don't you get bored? You know, people say today, I get bored. I, what am I doing? I don't know what to do. So they get on their WhatsApps and their chats and online and they watch things. I was so bored, I watched three hours of YouTube videos. I mean, that's not much, to be honest, for some people, right? But he says, uh, somebody said to him, Allah tastawhish, don't you get bored? Don't you get alone? Don't you get frightened with your own company? He said, كَيْفَ astawhish." How can I get bored? How can I get, how can I feel alone? وَأَنَا مَعَ النَّبِيِّ وَأَصْحَابِهِ When I am always with the Prophet and his, and his companions Why is he with the Prophet and his companions? He's studying hadith in a very practical way so that he can transport himself back and really feel like he's part of it. He used to, he, he used to say that the trace of ink on the garment of scholars, right? Uh, a trace of ink, a trademark of, you know, because when you write so much, you're going to have ink over your hands in those days, especially when you have to use a reed pen and, and, and be, uh, what do you call it, dipping into a, uh, an ink pot as such. He says that the trademark of a hadith scholar is ink on his garments. And he says that this is better and more superior than the perfume on the bride's garment. You know, perfume on a bride's garment, you just got married, right? Or your husband's garment for the women, right? So, just, you know, just what that creates in a person, he's saying that this, it gives you more enjoyment than that. I mean, these people, without their sacrifice, we wouldn't have been where we were today. SubhanAllah. We owe them a lot. Ibn al-Mubarak says that I took knowledge from how many teachers? Anybody want to give a guess? How many teachers do you think he studied under? Like, what's a, what's a rational amount? A, a huge amount. How many teachers have you guys studied with? Has any of us studied with? Right, just think about it. I think the last time I counted, I could count at least 50. Right, at least 50. And that's just in my adulthood, not, not, not you know, when I was young. And I didn't, even ca I didn't even count my school teachers. I just counted my religious teachers. So how many do you think he studied by? Number? 100. 100. Anybody else? Okay, that was a random number, right? That was a random number. Any more random numbers? Okay, 4,000. He took from 4,000 individuals. When he went to all of these cities, they were full of scholars in all of these cities. Remember, that was, one of, oh, that was a very, very productive period, that uh, second century, you know, the middle of the second century. He took from 4,000 scholars, but he related, he transmitted from only a quarter of them, 1,000. So he sifted. There were some scholars he would go to, he heard something strange coming from them, he would just burn all of his books. He would, he, he would just delete everything, right? So, but he only transmitted from a thousand of them, approximately a thousand of them. And Abbas, uh, uh, one, of, one of the scholars of time, he says that, I tried to figure out who these thousand are by looking at his works and who he's transmitted from, and I could work out at least uh, 800 of them. So it's not just a claim, he, it's, it's documented. Because you know when they relate in those days, they say, Haddathana so-and-so, and so-and-so so related to us, so-and-so related to us, up to the Prophet ﷺ. So you can tell who they've taken it from. So it's not just a claim we're speaking about. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, numerous times he went into Baghdad, which was then established um, uh, to, to teach, to, uh, to, to, uh, to speak. I had mentioned earlier that it wasn't established, but it was probably a brand new city uh, at the time, right? And he, he'd gone there as well from Mar. It mentions that once Harun al-Rashid, the great Abbas al-Khalif, one of the greatest that they've known actually, Harun al-Rashid, he came to Maru. And no, actually he came to Raqqa. Raqqa is actually in Syria. It's in a sad situation today, right? But it's in Syria, north, uh, northeastern part of Syria today, Raqqa, right? He said he visited Raqqa, and it was a very famous city at the time. And Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak also visited. 
and people just gathered around him to such a degree that, you know, it says that straps of their sandals were broken in the rush to be around him. Because, you know, people have sandals and when you're stepping on each other's sandals just in the rush to get around him. And he says so much, it, it mentions that so much uh, dust uh, because in those days it wasn't as perfectly done up the roads and so on. And a wife of, uh, one of the women of the house of, uh, of the palace, she looked out and she just saw what was going on. She says, what's going on here? You know, is this uh, one of the royals have come in or whatever the case is? And they say, this is the, one of the alims of Khurasan. One of the alims of Khurasan. And he's, uh, he's arrived and people are going to visit him. And she said, Wallahi, hadha wallahi al-mulk. This is true sovereignty. This is true kingdom. This is true rule. He says, La mulka Harun, not the kingdom of Harun. Not the rule of Harun, الَّذِي لَا يَجْمَعُ النَّاسِ إِلَّا بِشُرَةِ وَأَعْوَانِ Who can only gather people like this using police and his security detail. This is true, king, this is true kingdom. Abdullah ibn Sinan says that once uh, Abdullah ibn Mubarak visited Makkah Mukarrama, and I was there as well at the time. And as he was departing Makkah Mukarrama, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, one of the great muhaddithin, his name comes quite often, he went to see him off, both him and Fudayl ibn Iyad. Fudayl ibn Iyad is another one of those great scholars of the time. Both of them went to see him off. You know, they, they walk with him to the edge, edge of the city. One of them just commented, هَذَا فَقِيهُ أَهْلِ الْمَشْرِقِ This is the jurist of the people of the East. So the other one said, no, the people of the West as well. And he is the scholar of the East and of the West. Basically from a young age, from the age of 23 at least, he's been just traveling and just acquiring knowledge from all of these different scholars like Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, Yahya ibn Ma'in, Hibban ibn Musa, Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba, Uthman ibn Abi Shayba. I mean, these are just names for us, right? For many of us, but I'm just mentioning them. You know, some, maybe on a day of judgment, they might help, for, help us. Like, hey, we did hear about these guys. Hey, I met you on the, you know, I've, I've, I've ever heard about you on a day of judgment. You know, I, I know, I know other people as well, but you know, we know, we know like uh, a lot of people. Uh, we know all of the stars today. We know all of our footballers and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just mentioning some names. Maybe we'll stick one day and, you know, hopefully help us. Uh, one of the great Maliki scholars, Ibn Abdul Barr, he says that I don't know any of the jurists, right, specifically jurists, who has been so protected from anybody criticizing him. Meaning, nobody's criticized him except Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. When you're a jurist, when you're a jurist, based on certain decisions you take, certain judgments you make, there's going to be some criticism of the other. But Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak was just so loved and he did it just so well, right? That he is, they say, an agreed upon personality. It's... Let's just look a bit, I mean, we don't have enough time today to look at his life in complete detail, but we're going to take snatches of different aspects of his life, his piety and his scrupulousness. Nobody can be so accepted among people and go beyond his life. Because look, you've got people who become very famous today. They'll have this many Twitter followers and they'll have this many Facebook followers. However, they do one thing wrong and it's all gone. When they die out, somebody else takes their place. The trend changes every day. Somebody else comes up on Snapchat or wherever it is. So it's always constantly changing. With these people, they have taken a place in history until today that we are speaking about him in Imperial College. Right? That's quite an amazing thing, right? For him to be chosen, subhanAllah. And I still can't get over the fact that that verse was just the right verse that was recited, subhanAllah. Anyway, it's related... From Hassan ibn Arafah, he says that Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak said to me, now look at this. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak said to me that once, while I was in Sham, in Syria, I borrowed a pen from someone to write. Because he says he used to always take notes. Though he had a great memory, he used to always take notes. And he says, if it wasn't for notes, I would never have been able to maintain accuracy of my information as much as I did. Very important, take notes. Right? He says, I borrowed a pen from somebody in Maru, uh, sorry, in Sham. Where is he from? He's from Maru. That is quite a few, you know, that, that is quite a distance away. 
I borrowed the pen and I thought that I had given it back, but apparently I'd put it where I used to use, I used to put my pen. So I didn't realize. And I came back home to Marl. And I realized that I've still got the pen with me. It's literally like I've gone to America or I went to Egypt or to Saudi. I borrowed somebody's pen and I came back to the UK. Hey, I, I've, I've still got somebody's pen here. Like, you know, well, he went all the way back to give it back. Now, today we could probably post it back, but in those days you had to go back. He went all the way to give it back. This is what you, talk, what you call piety and scrupulousness. Being very particular, because it matters. Now, I could, you could just say, you could justify it. Right, he's going to understand. I'm from another area. He's going to understand. He'll probably forgive me. I'll, if I go back there one day, I'll tell him. Now, you, we, we will justify like this. But at the end of the day, when you do that to your heart then you just make it that much more dishonest and then you become more dishonest day by day you become more dishonest day by day and you start doing that in everything so he goes all the way back just for the sake of his scrupulousness and the thought about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of his wonderful statements of wisdom he says that when the good traits of a person dominate his bad traits then people will never mention his bad traits. People generally have an overview. There are obviously some skeptics and critics that are always looking for the bad, like pigs always looking for the muck, right? You get people like that. But in general, when your goodness dominates, then your the the the, the, the problems everybody has, the defects, the they, they generally get dominated. But if you have more bad traits within you, then your good traits will become dominated and nobody will mention them. That's a very, very wise opinion. He says another thing, very, very interesting. When I thought about this, it's very true. He says that man bil ulama dhahabat akhiratuhu. If you humiliate, if you humiliate and look down upon scholars of the deen, then your akhirah is disappeared. Your akhirah has been destroyed. If you he try to humiliate the rulers of this world, then your dunya is spoiled. Your world is gone. They will make it hell for you, right? When it comes to scholars, they won't do anything. Allah will just make the akhirah hell for you, essentially. Right? And if you mess around like this and humiliate and don't show any respect to your friends, your companions, then you lose all of your common decency. You're not seen as a decent person. You're not seen as a decent person. Showing you akhlaq and character. Imam Dhahabi mentions in his Siru Alam in Nubala that Ibn al Mubarak once came to visit, he's in another city, Hamad ibn Zayd, another great scholar, right? Hadith scholar. Hamad ibn Zayd looked at him. Now he knows that he's from another city, he's a stranger, he doesn't know who he is. But what he saw, Really amazing. You know, sometimes you see somebody's like, who is this guy? So he said to him, where are you from? Where are you from? He said, I'm from Khurasan. I'm a, I'm a Khurasani, right? I'm specifically from Maru in Khurasan. So Hamad ibn Zayd says to him, do you know a man called Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak? He just heard about him. He'd never seen him. So he's saying to him, do you know Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak? He says, yeah, I do. Ma fa'al? What does he do? He's the one who's speaking to you. He's the, he's the one who's holding conversation to you. So then he made salam and really like welcomed him. That's the kind of thing we're speaking about. Mu'adh ibn Khalid. I mean, I know these names sound, I mean, these, just, these are just names for most of us, but these are great hadith scholars. You know, for those people who are in, the, uh, in this vocation, they will understand. Mu'adh ibn Khalid, he says that once I asked Ismail ibn Ayash about Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, and Ismail said to me, he said, "Ma ala wajhil ardi mithlub nul mubarak." On the surface of this earth, there is nobody like Abdullah ibn Mubarak right now. And then he made this statement. He says, "Wala alam." I don't know of any praiseworthy trait, any good praiseworthy character trait that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has created, except that He has put all of them in Abdullah ibn Mubarak. He was such a wonderful person. He was just a wonderful human being, a very, very loving human being and he says that my friends my friends so this is uh, 
the friends of Ismail ibn Ayyash, right? He's saying, my friends once with, went with him, traveled with him from Egypt to Mecca. And all the way he would treat them, he would give them to eat of this khabis, which is basically this date halwa, right? This date uh, sweets made out of dates. And he would be fasting throughout. He would be feeding them and he would be fasting throughout. Imam Dhahabi calls him the pride of the Mujahideen because they said that one year he used to go for Hajj and the other year he used to go uh, in, in Jihad, he used to be at the uh, frontiers of the Islamic lands because there was a, always a constant tussle in those days. See, today we have uh, demarcations, this country, that country, right? It's a bit more, we have problems, but, you know, in certain parts of the world at least, but, uh, you know, there's generally a line, a clear-cut buffer zone. In those days there was a constant... Uh, back and forth so you had to guard your frontiers and that was what you call ribat ribat so every second year he would be in the path of Allah at the ribat and many times he would actually take part in the war and he was very he had great valor in his fighting numerous numerous stories related related about that as well so he was not just the person who sat down but he was very active as well when he had to be he used to perform Hajj one year, and in the next year he would be stationed in the battles of the uh, uh, on the Ribat in Tarsus and Al Masisa, which is uh, near the land of the Romans as well as other places. His generosity, Khatib al Baghdadi relates. Remember, he had a lot of money. Now, generally, people with a lot of money, what do they do with their money? If they can spend, then they can accomplish a lot. Right? So, Khatib al Baghdadi mentions that. Ibn al-Mubarak say, said, actually he, he read from this man called Ali ibn al-Fudayl. Ali ibn al-Fudayl says that my father was a companion of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. And my father asked him, you command us to be ascetic, like not indulge in the dunya and not have too many possessions and so on. But we see that you have so much. You have good food. And, you know, you, you, you really have a lot of the dunya. Why is that? So he turned around to him and says, Oh, Abu Ali, I only do that to protect my face from humiliation, having to ask others. Because when you have money, generally people respect you at least for that. And in those days, you know, if you didn't have, you'd have to go to the governor, you'd have to go to the ruler, the khalif, and so on and so forth. And then it'd be this really endless problem that you may... You, you won't be respected. And scholars had to be respected, especially scholars, so that they could really contribute. So he says, I do this to protect my face, to honor myself so that I can be independent from others. I don't have to rely on anybody else. And I also use it to aid me in my obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once Ibn al-Mubarak, he goes from Baghdad, he departs from Baghdad, and he wants to go to a place called Masisa. Now this is a place from Baghdad, Masisa is actually a city, uh, an, an ancient city. I don't, think it, I don't think it survives anymore. It's in Turkey. It's in modern day Turkey. So he's going all the way from Baghdad to a city in Turkey. And a number of the Sufis of his time, they want to go with him. Now this is, uh, th this is uh, uh, you know, for this, uh, th this is actually in the path of Allah. This is uh, for some kind of frontier protection or some kind of battle or something like that. So... He gets everybody around him and he says, I know you people are embarrassed when people spend on you. You don't like to accept from others. You don't like to accept help. So let's do one thing. He told one of his, one, one of his uh, servants to come along and bring a bowl, covered it up with a cloth. And he said, take this round to everybody and everybody should contribute whatever they have. So we'll make a, a pool of money. So if you've got 10 dirhams, 20 dirhams, whatever it is, just whatever money you've got for your, for, for your trip, then just put it inside here. Some people put in there 10 dirhams, some people put 20 dirhams. They didn't have that, too much money. So he puts it all together. And then he said, I'm, I'll, I will now take care of all the expenses. Right? From here, I will take care of all the expenses. It wasn't really much money. On the entire trip, he paid. They went into, they, they, they went into uh, uh, until Masisa, until the entire trip, he, sp he spent on them, he spent on them, and then after Masisa, it was a frontier place, and then after that everybody had to disband and was sent to different places. So then he says, okay, now, whatever's left, we will distribute it. Right? Whatever's left, we'll distribute. They, I don't think they expected anything to be left. So, 
he started giving everybody 20 dinars each. Now, just to give you an idea, a dirham is a silver coin and a dinar is a gold coin. And there's a massive difference between the two. It's 1 to 20, right? So they had contributed 10 or 20 dirham, silver coins, and he's giving everybody back 10, 20 dinars each. So they are saying that I only gave you 20 dirhams, you're giving me 20 dinars. He said, yeah, you get a lot of barakah in the path of Allah, right? You get a lot of blessing in the path of Allah, so your money is increased. That's how he used to spend on other people. There's another, it was hatch time. Now he is, he, he is in Marr and they're all going for hajj. Remember he goes every second year. So during this time, his, all of his companions, his friends, they gather around and they're saying to him that we want to come with you for hajj this year. Right, we want to come with you for hajj. So he says, okay, no problem. He says, give me your money. Right, whatever money you've got for the trip, give me your money. He took it all. And he put it in a box and he locked that box. He says, I'll look after your money and I'll spend on you on the way. He says that from there, he paid for their, their travel costs. He paid for their hotels in those days called khans, right? These lodging, he paid for them. He spent on them with the best of foods that money could buy in those days, right? Treating them all the way. I mean, you'd probably say staying at five star hotels all the way kind of thing in those days. He says then he went to Baghdad and there he fed them with good desserts, creams and uh, what else you got these days? Right. Cookies and cream and you got all of these, you know, dessert places nowadays, right? So he fed them all of that until they went to Medina Munawwara. So they get to Medina Munawwara first and then he asked everybody, can you tell me what your shopping list is that your family has given you that you need to buy from Medina Munawwara? Because Medina and Makkah were places where things from the entire world used to come. So even nowadays, people there go to buy hijabs and you know, jubbas and all of these things. Give me your list. He purchased everything for them. Then they go to Makkah and after they'd finished their worship, he says, what have you been demanded to buy from Makkah? And again, the same kind of thing. He bought from all of them. He came back. Finally, they came back. And the other thing he did was he went and he kind of decorated the front of their homes and everything just while they'd been away. They, they, there was all this maintenance that you had to do by adding lime and things like the limestone or something like this in those days. And then on the third day, he gave them a banquet, a big dawah, right? A big food invitation, a big party. After they had eaten everything, he brought out that box, he opened it and he gave back everybody's bag of money that they had. So he basically gave them a free hajj. Now those kind of tour groups don't seem to exist anymore nowadays. Right? You go with the best shaykh in the, in the world, right? and it's all free five-star package. Allahu Akbar. Right. One story about his piety. He, was, he used to always hide his state. He was never showing off about anything. Uh, one of his friends, Muhammad ibn A'yun, a companion of his, he says that once I was with him in a particular exp on a particular expedition, and it was nighttime, and we both had to go to sleep. Right, for the next day. And he says, what happened is, I lay, lay down as well, pretending to sleep. I wanted to see what he, he was doing. The lights all went off. And when he thought that I was asleep, he got up, did his wudu or whatever, and he started praying. All the way until Fajr time, and then he came to wake me up. And I, that's when I told him, I've been awake all this time. And he got so upset with me. He got so upset with me that after that, he hardly spoke to me during the entire trip that now I've been found out, now that I've been found out. So he used to always hide all of these things. He didn't want people exposing his deeds. That's why I say that when people look back at his life, they find this really complete person. You know, you could have somebody who does a lot of worship and then he shows off. But no, he did a lot of worship. He was very generous. He had money. He had a lot of knowledge, but he was also very subdued and very controlled and very connected to Allah. It's very difficult to get somebody with all of these qualities. A Jewish neighbor of his, he lived next to a Jewish individual in Maru, right? And it shows you that Muslims can live next to Jews, as we do in Stamford Hill, right? And it works, alhamdulillah. There's less fitna in that area, by the way. You don't see weird things that you see in other areas. The Muslims and Jews in Stamford Hill, you know, it's generally very modest, modestly dressed people you see. It's quite a barakah, right? In that sense. Anyway, so a Jewish neighbor of Ibn al-Mubarak decided to sell his house. The price? 2000 and people said to him, it's not even worth 1,000. How are you asking for 2,000? He said, 1,000 for the house and 1,000 to be a neighbor of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. 
Even he valued that. Later, Abdullah ibn Mubarak found out about this and he said to him, look, don't sell your house, take the money here. He gave him the money, he said, don't sell your house. Once somebody, tell, uh, somebody, you know when scholars go, they say, can you give us some advice, please? So he said, uh, somebody said to him, is there anybody that can advise us? So he turned around and he says that, is there anybody to accept the advice? Lots of advice is given. Is there anybody to accept the advice? As I mentioned, he, had, he was born in 118 Hijri. And people like this get a great death as well. When they, when they have to depart from this world as people have to depart from this world. Now they've got this whole cryogenic freezing that people are paying. You know, one day they're going to wake up. And subhanAllah, I mean, you know, you can make a lot of money these days by doing these, you know, let, let me, and there's only two facilities, one in America, one in Russia, and people are paying for that. You want a business? Start one in England, right? <laughs> SubhanAllah, you know. So, he's back on his way from Sus, and it's the month of Ramadan, and he is in the Ambar province, which is to the east of Baghdad. Unfortunately, there's a lot of problems there. That's kind of the Sunni passage that extends into Jordan today, right, in, in Iraq. And he was there in Ramadan, it was the 10th of Ramadan, and he's on the bank of the Euphrates River, and this is where he eventually passed away. When he was near to his death, when he was near to his death, Nasr, who was there, he told him, put my head on the earth. And Nasr began to weep, saying that, and he asked him, why are you weeping for? He says that, I remember that you, what the blessings of this world you had while you were alive, and now you're going you know, just back into the dust like a stranger and a pauper. So Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak said to him, he said to him that, be quiet, I asked Allah throughout my life to keep me wealthy, but to make me poor before I die, so I can go to Allah empty-handed. I can go to Allah empty-handed. What you have to remember is that the poor people will enter Jannah, and paradise before the rich ones. However, when you get into paradise, then if you've done a lot with your money, you'll get a higher place than a poor person. So though a poor person might get into paradise faster because they've got less forms to fill, less liability, right? Less tax returns, right? But because you don't have enough money to spend, you won't get the higher levels of Jannah, though you may get in further. So there's a being a wealthy person, but also being able to go in Jannah first will be a great thing. Ibn al-Mubarak, he says that there was a person who was sitting next to him towards his time when he was about to pass away. And the person said to him, Say la ilaha illallah. And he kept saying, Say la ilaha illallah, you know, when, as we say to people when they're about to pass away. So, Abdul Umar, even at this time, he says, you know, this is not good what you're doing. This is not good what you're doing. You are basically inconveniencing a believer at the time of his death. What you're supposed to do is to say softly, La ilaha illallah, and when the person who's about to die has said La ilaha illallah once, then you stop, because that's his last word. Then if he says something else, then you say La ilaha illallah again to remind him. But you don't say, keep saying La ilaha illallah. This is not that time when you keep trying to let him think, and this is what's very important. When Harun al-Rashid was told that Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak has passed on, he said, Mat al yawm Sayyidul Ulama. Today, the leader of the ulama has passed away. When Sufyan ibn Uyayna found out and was told that he had passed away, he said, May Allah have mercy on him. He was a man of fiqh, knowledge, worship, asceticism, and generosity. He was a c courageous person and he was also a poet. He has numerous poets, poems to his name. I'll just finish off by mentioning some of his statements that are very thought provoking. One of his statements is, how often, listen carefully, how often does a small deed become very big, just a small deed, become very big in the sight of Allah due to one's intention? And how does a very big deed often become very small and insignificant, again because of intention, of showing off and so on? Intention really matters in our faith. He then said to people, he said, if you wish to backbite anybody, speak behind their backs. Because, some, you know, I said that he used to just like staying in his house. So people used to say to me, you pray with us, and then after that you go back into your house. He said, yes, because I spend the time with the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa and his companions. And the other thing is that you guys backbite too much. So I don't want to be part of that conversation. He said here, if you people want to backbite, 
then backbite your parents. Do riba of your parents. Now, why would you ever do that? But if you are, if you really feel like doing, you've got the urge and it's itching to backbite, then do it of your parents so that your reward does not go out to a stranger. It stays within the family. <laughs> it stays within the family. The, he says, the inhabit, now th uh, think about this one. The inhabitants of this world, many of the inhabitants of this world have left this world and departed without tasting the best thing within it. And what is the best thing in the world, he was asked. And he said, knowing Allah, knowing your Lord, knowing your Creator, and then departing this world. That is the most important thing. When a person realizes this, that's when he's really realized what he is. I leave us with this, that, O oh Allah, grant us an understanding of these people, grant us inspiration through these people, grant us the ability to follow in their footsteps, to be inspired by their piety, their righteousness, their scrupulousness, their fairness, their justice, their generosity, and their connection and devotion to Allah. And allow, allow us to also leave a memory behind that somebody remember us. Can you imagine if Ibn al-Mubarak had done as his father had told him, which is just do a business. He would have enjoyed his life maybe even more. He would have been fixed in that place and had a big family business. But do you think we would have been speaking about a businessman from Marwa today? We're speaking about Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak because of what he did. Think what you can contribute to this world before you leave, however small that contribution may be. Don't just contribute to yourself, which is essentially consumerism, but contribute. What can you leave behind for humanity in general? That is a very big message that I see from him. He did... He also became a businessman later on. But that businessman was under his spread of the knowledge. It wasn't primarily businessman. It was primarily a scholar, but business to provide the engine to run his dawah program. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq and wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.